Hello again, and welcome back to the Slow Flower Show with Deborah Prinzing. This is episode 559. I'm so delighted today to share my wonderful conversation with artist Ronnie Nicole Robinson. Ronnie creates works in plaster and paper, and all of her pieces are botanically inspired, utilizing flowers, branches, and stems that she clips from surrounding gardens and nature to incorporate into her embossed surfaces. When planning the 2020 Slow Flowers Summit, the theme Flowers as Artist Muse emerged, and it felt like an ideal message to connect stories, aesthetics, and crafts of each of our gifted presenters. I knew I wanted to invite Ronnie Nicole to share her unique point of view and her floral embellished artwork to inspire our summit attendees. Ronnie Nicole has been creating flower fossils, as she calls them, in plaster and paper, pursuing her art full time for several years. Join me today on a virtual tour of the Ron Nicole studio in New Hope, Pennsylvania, And I know you'll enjoy the experience as this gifted artist discusses her process and techniques, as well as her philosophy of art, design, nature, and beauty. I'll save our sponsored thank yous after the conversation. So let's jump right in and meet Ronnie Nicole Robinson. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Slow Flower Show. This is episode 559, and I'm Deborah Prinzing. And today I'm so thrilled to introduce my guest, Ronnie Nicole Robinson. Hi, Ronnie. Hi, Deborah. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me. Oh my gosh, it's just wonderful to see you in your in your beautiful studio setting. Um, we're going to talk about the Slow Flower Summit and introduce you to people who might be coming or might be thinking about coming. Um, but first of all, I just want to thank you so much for being uh, open to saying yes when we invited you to come to the summit. I kind of was stalking you on Instagram. You didn't really know who I was. <laughs> but um, I just love your work. How do you describe your your um, medium and your work in terms of, um, are you a surface designer? Are you a... Um, multimedia artist? I call myself a relief artist. Um, they're raised details. Um, the ending product, is, ending the art is um, plaster or paper. So okay. I work with those mediums, but I would, I would consider that relief work. That's, that's good to learn the term. And you're um, coming to us from your studio in New Hope, Pennsylvania. And where is that? Is that outside of Philadelphia or? Um, it's about an hour from New York and an hour from... Philadelphia. Oh, that oh, wow! Like right in the middle. It's in Bucks County. Okay, okay. Well, so I, uh, those of those of our listeners who have been following you on Instagram have followed the journey of creating this beautiful space. But maybe you can talk a little bit about how you landed there. Like this was a a, a many year endeavor to have your own studio and not what be working on your kitchen table or something like that. <laughs> um, well, I mean, we it all started in um, an apartment, six hundred fifty square feet. In Rittenhouse, Philadelphia. Okay, let's let's be real. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this has been a long, long, long journey. I've been doing this for at least six years. Um, it has taken up all of our space, all every room in the, in our home. Um, is is it's consumed our lives, our marriage. <laughs> so it was just a really, really happy moment when we heard about the space. Um, it wasn't planned. Technically, we uh, were running away from a rock quarry that is going to be put behind our property. So it put us on the chase of like, okay, we got to go. We have to find a new space because we couldn't do any more investment into the space that we already had because we lived on a farmhouse and it was our, our like dream to like grow our own flowers and just have like a really nice ambiance. But uh, we had to kind of make a change in that. Yeah, let me stop you there. So you had left the city and and thought you were going to establish sort of a con- a, li- a little bit of a country property with with mm-hmm. a, f- growing flowers and making art. Yeah, right. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Oh, it w- it was pretty devastating. But looking at what every how everything turned out, it was probably meant to be. It's not to say, like, I think in the future we are going to find that next farmhouse, and now we know what kind of zonings to look for. <laughs> Um, like, <laughs> like what's happening to the adjacent properties? Yes. <laughs> oh, yes, geez. yes. Um, um, so we're definitely going to like try that again. But for now, we were really excited with New Hope. They came up, um, it's a nonprofit organization 
And the only reason why we can even afford to be here is because of that, because they have um, available spaces that are um, very affordable. Uh, we never imagined that I would be in like my own standalone building um, in New Hope. Like I came wow. here five years ago, um, dreaming, wishing, hoping. And I was like, wow, this is such a cool town. Everyone's artists, but it was really expensive. <laughs> right. So the nonprofit uh, supports um, independent artists who yes. need need to be given a space to work in, right? Yes. So it, they, they create spaces that are affordable, basically. Um, I, I, I mean, like, I can't imagine that, like, this here wouldn't cost, like, a lot of money somewhere else. Um, oh, so it, it's I'm just do that it's just um, fun looking at like the the light flowing in the windows behind you on the yes. counter with the little cafe curtains and your plants and describe the space how big is it so i would i think it's about 800 square feet um i knew the moment that i got this space that i had to call my friend nicole um she worked um she she owns vestige home she designed the entire space for me um she's known me for a long time we kind of started this journey together um, she got into interior design and I was doing this and I said, one day I'm going to hire you to do my space. <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's so great. So th what do you, what's upstairs and what's downstairs? I see so, behind you, it looks like there's some kind of machine. Is that like a press? Oh, so this is my press? press. Okay. This is where I press my clay. Back in the day, I used to do it by hand and it would take me about eight hours to roll it out by hand. Now I can do it in about 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least your your, your upper body uh, workout was uh, clay, yes, clay maneuvers. I have, I have very strong arms. <laughs> <laughs> I have a very, very strong arms. But now my husband does it and it's really nice, but this saves a lot more time. Um, I'm really happy that I know how to roll it out by hand. So no matter what, I can always go back and do that. But having this 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 clay roller is has saved my life. Sure, has saved my hands, my back. Um, <laughs> yeah, people don't really think about that. The like the ergonomics of being an artist, like a, a, a yes. an artist working with heavy material, it must it takes a toll. It's, um, there, like especially during winter, if I am working, um, even now, uh, my hands are very dry because of the clay um they, they crack <laughs> mm, mm. so there's a certain time of the year where i know this is i'm just going to go through the pain i have to understand this is a new threshold of pain that i have to deal with <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> oh honey well i we got off track i started to ask you about downstairs and upstairs so um oh, yes, i see so, that the staircase behind you yeah so when we first got here this was a um this was a a, a spiral staircase and unfortunately our dog could not get up Stairs. Like we tried and she got halfway up there and she froze and she was very scared. And we were like, okay, well, that's the first thing that we have to change. Uh, we were considering it, but she, she basically made it the thing that we had to do. Um, so upstairs, we wanted a place where we could kind of hang out. Um, one of the things about being someone who's self-employed, you work a lot. So I'm a bit of a workaholic. Um, I had neat moments where I can just walk away yeah. and sit down and just kind of relax. Um, but also why we have a space that's not in our home anymore because I work a lot. Um, but she did such a great job of like just picking out colors. She knows blue is my color, but we like, she just knew that I wanted something very minimalist, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I wanted to feel like Ron Nicole. Um, she left me room to like, kind of fill in at, like, as we go along, um, I didn't want like every portion of the space to be completed. I wanted to like put my touches onto it. Right. Um, <laughs> well, is it, a, is it an old, is it an older building? Cause it looks like there's sort of a old, um, beam above yes. the windows. So this is, an, I, I want to say it was, it's been here for, since the 1800s. Wow. That's um, amazing. It used to be a stable. Mm -hmm. um, when we got here, the roof was kind of coming in. Um, the floors were much darker. We put new floors in, we put a sink in. Like we just wanted it to be, because like they gave us such an affordable rate, we wanted to give something back. And whoever comes in here the next time is going to have a really nice space. Oh, absolutely. You're paying it forward. Hopefully you'll stay yes. there for a long, long time. I'm going to stay here. I mean, I'm going to at least put in about four or five years. Um, but again, we're going to look for that farmhouse. That's what we're doing. 
We mm. want, we do want that. We just know we have to do it differently mm. this time mm. and have more research <laughs> involved into it. So you made a comment about your interior designer, designer wanting to make this Ronnie's space or Ronnie reflect Ronnie's vibe. What, how do you describe your aesthetic? Um, is it, it, it's not, it's sort of a combination of modern and 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 old fashioned in a way. Like uh, you have a yes. nostalgia about what you do, but it's yes. got a, a modern edge. Yes, I think that's um, one of the things. Um, it kind of like describes my artwork. My artwork is very reminiscent of Wedgwood, but there's a more modern approach to it. Um, so I think like that was kind of her inspiration. Like I love color, but we had to be careful with color mm -hmm. because. I already have a lot of uh, <laughs> color in my artwork. So, and we wanted the artwork to stand out. So yep. she definitely went with the white walls, but she added a lot of warm tones. Um, she was able to find like old and new. Um, uh, we were able to find like this, I have this beautiful table that I'm working on. It's nine feet long. It's all marble. It's great for clay. Oh my um, goodness. Like I started when I used to like, before this, I was working on probably a 44 inch table. Okay. Like to be able to like do things and to imagine these new pieces was really, really hard. I had to work one at a time. And as an artist, you want to have multiple projects happening. So you're not like depending on this one piece to work. It's like soul crushing if it doesn't, you know what I mean? Because you've put all this time in. But now I get to work on four or five pieces, six pieces at a time. So it's not like this, like, the day the, the the world is going to end if one piece doesn't right work out. <laughs> and you don't have to like turn it off and on and and then wait a whole 24 hour period before you can go to the next piece yeah i I've, I've seen that table uh and i i will will share all the uh links to your social media places a nine foot table that's such a luxury ronnie i'm so happy for you like it's the 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 core element of that space for you isn't it it is it was the most important thing she, like as soon as she saw my table that i was working on she's like we gotta get you a bigger table <laughs> <laughs> well, you, know? you, men you mentioned Wedgwood, and um, I and you mentioned that blue is your color. So Wedgwood is um, is it American uh, a piece or is it English? That kind of it uh, ceramic English. is yeah, English. It's, okay, it's, it's, it's not American. But okay. I love, uh, my my husband's mother, she was a, a antiquer. She's one of the reasons why I even, I even started doing this. Um, and we're kind of the ideas because she. She had a, um, she has like these intaglios and they're so beautiful and framed. And she has, a, she had a bunch of like Wedgwood and different colors. And it was just like, okay, that's it. That's the idea. Like I wanted to look like that in my own way though. Yeah. You know, like for my own interpretation of that. So because that, that the surface has a raised, um, pattern to it. Right. I mean, yeah, that's so really that's what very, um, one of the things that people don't realize I don't paint um, I do paint some of my plasters, but when you see my Wedgwood style, that's not painted. That's layered um, plaster. Wow. That's layered um, with a, 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 um, a color background. Wow. So not painted. So it has that very, very matte feel. Um, it's very Can you sh and yeah. you have a couple pieces, right? Can you, sh I didn't mean yeah. to cut you off. Sorry. Let's see we can. Oh, wow. Oh, so that is an, that is stunning. That is breathtaking. It's oval what about 12 14 inches tall and about 12 inches um okay. seven inches wide these are kind of like i i started doing like these oval pieces so that i can do them in different colors um but this was like a test um i'm doing a dogwood collection for it is, and it's so beautiful ronnie so that <laughs> that piece how does it how did it start just as a a, a flat piece of plaster or is this clay so i first i um i get my block of clay it's a it's a cube basically and then we put it through the the clay roller right this tiny machine that does the work for us <laughs> now we still gotta crank it like this yes. arm, right arm is still strong you know it's still <laughs> manual <laughs> <laughs> but once we get smooth i spend probably an hour one of my secrets is i spend about an hour or two on the clay massaging it just getting it really, really nice and ready for it to, wow. to take on to those details. So it's, it's just, it really is just time consuming. And one of the things I'm learning, 
one of the reasons why I make so little um, pieces now. I, I used to make a bunch more pieces. I don't make as many because I have to spend so much more time on them if I want them to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. You can't cheat the process. <laughs> you really have to be into it. You have like, yeah. and I, I think the reason why I do well with this is because I like the process more than I even like the work. That's so I, wonderful. That's right. just you, you get lost. You get lost in the process of mm -hmm. of creating something that's in your mind's eye, and and you make it real. Yeah, it's like um, getting like a piece that works. That's a bonus for me. But it's really like trying to figure out the science of it, and because I take the clay, I take the plaster to a very extreme place. So it's very. Um, it's very important to make sure the climate, the atmosphere, there has to be a certain amount of humidity here. There has to be a certain amount of dry. Like it's just so many things that like to account for. So. Oh my goodness. <laughs> All those variables. So once you get that perfect surface, that's when you start layering on the botanicals or how, did, so how do you create that? To, like I first think about like where I want this, how I want it to look. Um, I have a, um, a background in graphic design. So space is very, very important to me. Um, I tell people all the time, like, you know, value space. Cause that's how like the eye is going to look like where, where people are going to look at and it's going to give the, it's going to like evoke a feeling, you know, and you don't want it to crowd up the entire area. You just want it to feel very like natural. So yeah. I don't m manipulate the flower too much. I try to find a flower that's going to fit the piece. So, <laughs> so like sometimes like I'll like go into like I went to the dogwood and I went um my neighbor um he's a mayor <laughs> Larry <laughs> wait the mayor of New Hope yes Larry he's uh, he's actually right across the street um so he lets me <laughs> go into his garden <laughs> but he has a dogwood tree and I pr I think I stared at it I would say for an hour before oh. I found the right one. Because I don't want to, I don't want to change the way it is. Like, so you I want that branch gesture to be exactly back the to the the space thing is the, the negative space you're talking about, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I want that to feel. I want it to feel like it's in that tree. I don't want. I want it to like capture just a little portion of that moment. That's that's uh, my way of like photographing it. You know, right. these pieces here. I preserve that moment, and now it's there forever. Um, oh my goodness. Me, like I, I'll just sit there for like an hour or two. Like, which one am I going to use? <laughs> and then I get my, um, <laughs> people probably think I'm crazy here too. Cause I do this all the time. Like I bring my, um, like if I'm using, <laughs> I bring my frames, I'll just carry, I'll just carry frames around with me and I'm just going up to flowers. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> I love it. Like what fits, what looks well, like what really looks nice, like how like, how will I like capture that? You know what I mean? So, <laughs> and walk so, around like <laughs> so Larry lets you cut the dogwood and then you bring that perfect pristine branch with blooms into the studio. And how do you, what's the next step then after that? It's, it's, it, I know it's a long process. So then it's, well, it's, that's the easiest part. Okay. Honestly, the pressing of it is the easiest part. Um, like I, I, I like design, so like negative space is important to me. It's, it feels natural. So like that part is the easiest. Um, I, I do like take my time. Like I use tweezers to put down each leaf the way I want it to be. Um, I try not to overlap unless I intentionally want it to overlap. Mm -hmm. um, not It doesn't always work every time. I don't always know what I'm going to get until I finish the piece. You know, like in my head, it might look a certain way. And then right. I finish it and like, and I see it and it's not that. So once you place the botanicals, it's into, is it wet clay or kind of semi, it's, it's, you can, it's you're making an wet. impression, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. I can actually show you one. I'm actually working. Oh, on good. That. Yes. Let's see. I'm so intrigued by all of this. <laughs> so let me, I'm actually going to bring this over. Um, and then Ooh, I'm we get put, to see the table too. Yes. So you see all these round guys here? Yes. Actually, do that let's use this one because you can see that um so right now i'm working on clematis and oh my goodness ronnie oh so the clay 
is uh, damp enough for you to imprint imprint. Yes, that, but that's firm a real enough to, but it has to be firm enough to hold the detail. So that's that... an actual real clematis that you've laid in there. Yes. Oh yes. my god. So as you can see, I have a bunch of them here. Um, I always give myself room to mess up. <laughs> and then and then you have a, a looks like some kind of custom box lid to keep them safe when they're so curing. this is basically to keep them moist this is a uh, create a controlled environment so i have a wet um, paper towel in here and i basically with this uh with the lid it basically keeps it moist i can come back once i take the flowers out i can come back um anytime and do them wow um i'll explain a little more about that um when I'm working with flowers, you have a, such a very small window. Um, you have a very small window, you know? So like the dogwood season is what, about two weeks of blooming time. So that means I have to get them all done. You know what wow. I mean? Right. <laughs> nature doesn't wait for me. Right. <laughs> and nature, like nature determines what you're working with at 12 months of yeah. the year. It's fascinating. Um, I've been trying to do this dogwood collection for years. We, um, we purchased a dogwood tree um, for our farmhouse when we moved in. We went down the street. There was a farm, a dogwood farm. And so we bought two trees. And every year, I swear, around May, right after Mother's Day, we get a cold front, a freeze front. Like oh. freeze, and it's like we lose the blooms. So I have been waiting <laughs> for years to do this. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. I'm so glad it worked out. And that's sort of that's sort of the responsive part of your artwork. Like you watch, you observe what's in bloom constantly. Constantly. Like you probably, if you have somewhere to go, you don't want to walk with me. <laughs> Why? Because you're one of those people who stops and checks every stem every along the way. Every flower. Like, oh, look at this. Oh, look at this. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, your but friends... Your friends and your husband um, are used to that. So they support your madness, right? Yes, yes. I mean, it's something I've been doing all my life, though. Like, it's one of the things, it's one of the stories I do tell is growing up, the neighborhoods were so bad, but we would walk to church. So I would always keep my head down. Um, so I wouldn't look at anything else. But then I would see dandelions like pop like coming through the cracks of the ground of the sidewalk so i would like start picking them but i would fall back like two blocks you know like I'm, and i'm like five or six you know <laughs> oh that's so cool i love i love that story when when uh joellen uh meyer sharp interviewed you for the slow flower summit blog um and i'll share that link for people to read you put you were going to church so you put the dandelion in the pages of the bible and then kind of inadvertently became a preserver of flowers. Yes, not knowing that. I didn't even know. I didn't even know what the term was. I didn't know that that's what people do. Um, but I will tell people that Bibles are the best way to press flowers. They keep them in like, like they're like pristine. Like it's something about the paper yeah. that's so great for pressing flowers. So that's anyone? so interesting. Mm hmm. But you do see that kind of like an old violet or some like lily of the valley. You see those sometimes in grandma's Bible, you know, that, yeah. that makes, that's so interesting. That, wow. That's why it's so cool because, you know, long before I'm like, long after I'm gone, they'll still be in those Bibles, yeah. you know, someone will see them one day and they'll have like, oh, where did this come from? You know, oh. and it'll be me. I love that. <laughs> yes. That story. So the, um, the clematis that you just showed us now, at some point you're removing the actual um uh, like herbaceous material or so i'll what, remove what? that flower okay um, i'll remove the flower i can actually show you another one stay right okay. there okay <laughs> oh, i love you're so you're so creative i love this <laughs> a lot of clay on them so this is what happens when i take the flowers out okay you... yes uh, so is that clay then dried at this point no okay still... so this is i'm still keeping it wet um, so that yep. it goes in. once it dries up, I won't be able to put the plaster in there. Oh, I see. So this is the mold then for the yes. plaster. Got it. This is the mold. That's so creative. Okay. So can you only use the mold once or, uh, do you use it over and over again? Um, I, I only use it once. Wow. That's amazing. Okay. 
So that becomes the pattern then for laying the, the paper in. Yes. Yes. Wow. So, um, so, well, no, for the paper, that's for the plaster actually. Oh, I'm sorry. So okay. I, um, so I will layer the, I will layer the white into this area here. Mm -hmm. And then when I frame it, I'll pour color plaster behind it. Oh, that's how you get the two colors. Oh my, how did you figure that out? That is mind blowing. Because uh, when you put the white in, you have to keep, have it completely flush with the, with the mold, right? So nothing it spills over. Work. It doesn't always work. <laughs> yeah. you know I mean? There have been many crying um, evenings. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it doesn't, yeah, so it doesn't always work. And I'm, and I'm also taking it to the extreme to get it to have that, um, as you can see, like that kind of like see-through quality. Yes. Yes. Wow. I have to thin out the um, the plaster. So, so you're kind of experimenting with the the consistency of the plaster just to get yeah. that. Wow. So that took um like this is how I always imagine my work to look, but unfortunately, when I first started, it did not. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess that's like the artist the artist challenge is like you've got this end product and in your mind's eye and then you're having to push the mechanics and the techniques to get what what you want to yes. achieve right yes and it's one of those like i've had always had such a great community who supported me so they're like they have work like all of the artworks that i have up there are from since i started until the uh, until now to okay the um so like i have pieces that were like my first ones and i didn't know how to do the layering yet you can tell I didn't think about spacing. I was just pressing as many flowers as I can because it was all new. Um, <laughs> but I like one of the things I was determined that I never did for myself before was just have patience that although I'm not good now and it's not what I want it to look like, if I just do this over and over again, I put my 10,000 hours in, I, I, I think I could do it. I think I wow. could get what I want out of it, you know? Wow. Well, I want to back up a little bit and talk about your path to this um, this life of yours that you've created, which props to you. It is that's the thing. Things don't happen overnight. You said ten thousand hours. Like you put in the discipline and the you know commitment to your art to for years. It sounds like to get to this point. Yes, like and, I, and that's one of the things I, I I talk a lot about on my Instagram. It's just that you we live in like this very instant gratification like life and yeah. the world. And that's why people like, they, they're afraid to fail. Yeah. So they want to be good right away. You're just not, that's just not going to happen. Like most of my plasters in the beginning was mush. Yeah. You know, like yeah. for a long time it, it took, I didn't even start with the right plaster. I didn't even know. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so you have to just be willing to like, to fail over and over and over again. And I think like if you get okay with failing, you have a, a develop a relationship with it, you'll be okay. You'll yeah. realize like, okay, over time I'll get better. That's it. That's the mm -hmm. answer to it. Over time I'll get better. I love that. And I think that it's like with any, um, any discipline rep repetition makes you better because then you have the muscle memory yes. and your every mistake you're, you're learning. Okay. How do I change my recipe? Mm -hmm. for the ratio of water to clay or whatever it is. Yes. Right. Yeah. Like it was constant. I have like books of it like <laughs> every day. Okay. This is what, like when I first started, I was determined. I, um, one, because I didn't have the roller, I had to condition myself to be okay doing this for hours and hours and rolling. So <laughs> I like, I told myself I'll roll one every day until it don't, it no longer hurts. Once it doesn't hurt more, then I know I'm okay. I've conditioned myself and I'm not thinking about that part anymore. I can think about the next thing. So now I can think like every time you move forward or you get better at something, you condition yourself, you can think about the next thing. So now I can think about um, spacing, design. I have room for those things. I didn't have room before because it was so painful. <laughs> oh, it's such a, it's such a, an analogy for any creative person, even mm -hmm. if they're in a different, even you know, someone in, who's a floral designer, like there, you have to have your, your proficiency in mechanics or skills or, you know, knowing principles. But if you don't start there, you won't get the, the beauty that you're yearning for. Yes. Um, I love that. 
you you do talk a lot about the life of an artist in your Instagram, and I feel like there's been some great moments of uh, honesty where I've been so impressed that you've shared with people, um, you know, what how you value your time and how you value your work, and mm-hmm. that and people have questioned pricing and availability, mm-hmm. and you know, do you feel like in general pe- you're getting support of when you post about that that people are responsive and supportive, uh, and saying okay, this is Artists don't talk about this, and Ronnie's talking about this. That was one of the things. So when I first got on Instagram, the most disappointing thing was there was not a real like conversation of how hard this was going to be. Yeah, one made it look so easy. Everyone's pictures were so beautiful. Everyone's home looked great. Like, so you just feel like useless. You feel like you're just failing because you don't have what they have. And then I start to realize oh, we're just seeing a very small clip of this person's life. Like, I do it all the time. You'll see, like, in many of my pictures, if you were to see the whole room, it would look a mess. It is that very small little picture, the little area that's, like, that looks good. And right. that's really how, like, Instagram and social media is. You know what I mean? So it's, I had to start telling, like, the truth. Like, this is not real. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I... I at this often I have more fails than I have wins Mm -hmm. and uh, that's just really hard you know what I mean and you're not going to always do great at it you're um you're going to make mistakes and that's okay um when I first started out I didn't know what to charge I didn't have any background on how to do this so I just kind of allowed people to mentor me like Mm -hmm. Susan from House of Brenson, like she was one of the first people to come to me and said, you have to raise your prices. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, oh, okay. Like, you know, like, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I mean, thank goodness that the universe brought people like that into your life because otherwise you're some pretty lonely existence mm-hmm. as a solo artist. Um, it, it, oh God, it is so, I'm so happy now that my husband worked with me because that would be, that's probably the hardest thing about being an artist that you're by yourself a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah. if you work a lot, that means you're by yourself a lot. So David's your husband and he is, um, he comes out of the wine industry, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so you get some good, he, he takes good care of you on, on feeding and, and, and filling your glass while you're <laughs> working together. Yes. I mean, so like when the pandemic happened, Restaurants started to basically shut down for a while, and his job was selling wine to restaurants. So, oh, wow. Um, it was like, okay, so what are we going to do? And I was like, well, I, I can use some help. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I, I was basically like drowning. You were a one woman um, show. I, I mean, I don't even know, like, still now, I don't know how I did it, but like, it was a lot. And after the, um, George Floyd um, happened and everyone started to ban behind um, black artists. Like things got even more blown up yeah. and not prepared, you yeah. know? So it was just one of those things where having his support and having him kind of walk me through it and, you know, slow me down. Like I don't have to sell to everyone just because everyone started like coming on, on board doesn't mean I have to like produce work out, you know, and right. that wouldn't have worked out for me. So he's, he's like my, like my reasoning ear, you know, like, yeah. like sometimes you just need the guy input, you know? <laughs> well, and, and it we sounds do like, so much. yeah, you trust each other. You, you trust his input too. And, and he probably trusts a, your instincts about your art as well. Yes. Yes. But he's just very good at like slowing down. Yeah. He's not like a, He's not like overly ambitious, which is good. Yeah. You know because I mean? it sounds like you, you are, so you're complimentary. <laughs> I'm, and I'm like, and the thing is like, I'm overly ambitious in like, like getting really, really good at this. Right. I'm not really ambitious in like selling a lot. And that, right. I don't know, I don't know how to connect those two. <laughs> right. Oh, that's interesting. Well, speaking of that, when, when, you were being pulled in so many directions and then you, you know, got a a lot of attention when people were trying to, uh, I don't know, mainstream art media and galleries and all wanted to showcase more, uh, black artists. I I feel like you, that at that same point, you also were trying to figure out how, 
how to make a, your art affordable and, and accessible. And that you, you've been, you know, you've talked about that in a really interesting way. Like it, it there's, you can't be all things to all people um, and be true to yourself. Yeah. I am not like one of the things it can be very confusing. So it's a very fine line. You can be all things, all people. I just want to be um, the most I can for the community that I, that, that has me, you know what I mean? Yeah. That has like, that has come into this and support it. So there are a lot of people who started, you know, supporting me from the beginning when my pieces were $40. So it would be, I wouldn't feel good not making, not having, something available in a price range where those people would still be able to support. Um, they were, they're the reason why I'm, I'm here. It's the reason mm. why I'm in the studio. They're the reason why I get, you know, featured. Like, so I have like, it always comes back to them. Um, and it'll, it always will. Like I can't, I know that when it comes to my handmade, I can't give to everybody. It's right. almost impossible. Right. They take so much time. Sometimes they take years to do. So there's just no way I can make that price point work for everyone, but I can create other things. And that's what we're doing. We have been working on that. Um, it's really, really important to us um, to make sure that anyone that's in our group can get something that's Ron Nicole. And that is a more on the paper side, right? In terms of the, um, the smaller um, embossed paper that you're doing, I'm using the wrong term, but no, that's, that's, like, that's I, I just, I just ordered one. It was the one with the camellia. And you had the um, blue, the m blue mat around it is. Oh, is, yes. That is, is that... our, so those are our embossed prints. Those okay. are not handmade by me at all. Okay. I draw it um, from a piece that it's inspired by and create like the shadows and things like that in the software. But then that goes off to a company. They create a brass plate. It's heavy. Yes. <laughs> It weighs a ton. And then um, I send it out to a place that will emboss the paper. I give them paper. So it's still like, I'm like, it's, even that is involved. <laughs> yes. But that's, that's an original piece by you that can be produced in multiples. Yes. Okay. So like, that's something that can be produced in multiples. It doesn't, um, I don't technically have to hand make it. Like if I have to hand make it, for some reason, I've picked the most like complicated medium <laughs> that I could. <laughs> I, I mean, that's okay. I love it. I love how you're pushing the medium and seeing what can you do. So yeah. that's, that's the, um, embossed paper. And then are, is there something else that you said was more printed? So we have, um, so this here, um, this is not an embossed paper. This okay. is a, a, uh, a handmade paper. Yes. 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 Um, actually and I, so that paper, then you're also making at one at one at a time, but you can, can you make multiples from the original mold? So the new way that we do it, we used to use um, a rubber mold, but they do not, they can be really recycled. Okay. Um, and Ron, my goal for Ron Nicole is to have the least amount of waste possible um, as we continue to grow. So I've reversed it. So now we use a different mold as a silicone, but it's a hundred percent and we ship it off to a company when we're done and they cut it up and remake it into something else. Oh, how great. Um, but now that we're doing it that way, the the mold that we have is plaster and we re dehydrate it and, re and remake them, but we only can get a couple of them out. We only get a couple of papers out, which is why our prices had to go up yes. because we can't produce as many anymore, but it's just the right thing to do. Yep. Um, so it is what it is, you know what I mean? Oh, like, <laughs> I love it. I it's so fun to talk about your process, and I guess when when uh, when you, I became obsessed with inviting you to speak at the Slow Flower Summit, and I I had this theme of flowers as artists muse, and several people are going to be speaking on how flowers are their muse, and yours is so unique because you every piece you do is inspired by a flower or a a true gift of nature, maybe a branch or something. Is that, can you just talk a little bit about how you went from the little girl picking the dandelion to uh, how flowers are still your muse in your work today? Um, and the fact that you are growing some of your own flowers. Well, um, so one of the things I love and appreciate about nature and I try to replicate is that it doesn't demand attention. 
we see it every day. We walk by flowers, don't even notice it. And I like that idea. So I wanted to replicate that. I try not to make anything that's like boastful. I don't want to take over a room. So it's always been my um, desire to cr like to create something that would just fall in the background. Um, so like, that's why I'm so inspired by nature because I, I like when I see people literally just walk by like the most beautiful plant. I'm just like, you really are just gonna walk by that? And that's <laughs> <laughs> race okay but like i like but that's good that's i i, I think it's okay that we take it we take it for a you know advantage of that we take yeah. it for granted because when we do stop like that means we take a moment you know what i mean like we're like taking a moment for ourselves so i try to put that into my work i try to replicate that i want people to slow down you don't have to look at it every day, but when that moment comes that you want to look at it, you'll see all the subtle details. You'll like stop it for a minute. You'll be on your phone. Like it's just really to slow down. And that's why I love working with nature. Like they're yeah. my muse because one, they show you what time is. You don't, nothing lasts forever. You get to see it go through a process. It's the way it, like from seed to the moment it dies, it dies. You know what I mean? So you know that like, nothing lasts forever but then they come back right i love um, it and like and you develop a relationship with these flowers like i've had many i'm sure every gardener knows this but like when a cold front comes in and you've been working your you've been working for like weeks and weeks to get ready and then like the cold front comes in and kills everything <laughs> you know, like right. you develop a relationship with these flowers and these plants, like you're caring for them, like you're, you're they're your little kids. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And then, you know, the, you know, the heartbreak and, and like you said, you have to wait 12 more months to try to try to re reclaim that, try that bloom or that fragrance. But it like the thing about nature that is so important, it allows us to live in the moment, also live in the past and think about the future. Um, a lot of us, we love flowers because they evoke these feelings of something we remember. Like people love dogwood because it reminds them of their grandmother or, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Someone who may mm -hmm. not be with us anymore. So like, it's wonderful. But at the same time, if you're a gardener, you have to plan for the future. Yes. You have to plant things in areas and you have to like imagine where, how it's going to grow. If it's going to be tall, it's going to create shadow on something else and, you know, make something that you, that's supposed to be full sun and now full shade. Like these are, you have to plan for the future. And I, I like that. I like that nature does that for us. It makes us live in the past, the present and the future. Uh, what a, what a beautiful way to, to think about uh, your relationship with flowers. And for those of uh, those who are, you know, watching and listening, um, most people have a relationship with flowers. That's why they're interested in the slow flowers movement. So, uh, you've summed it up in such a beautiful way. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Ronnie, I'm so excited to see you at the end of June at the slow flowers summit. I'm so yeah. honored. Like, I, I mean, one, just like talking to you and chatting with you is like, it's the best. I'm so honored that you even like wanted me to do this. Like, oh, I'm. <laughs> a lot of your fans are going to be there, and I, I, I have to just say, I'm so tickled to see that you're making connections with some other people who are going to be there, including my friend Lorene Edwards Forkner from Gardener Cook, who um, I just saw the two of you exchanging comments with each other, and I was like, oh, I love it when my my <laughs> friends get to know each other too. <laughs> Yes, so, yes, yes. She's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so that's that's great. Well, so Ronnie, how how can people get to know what you're doing and, and follow you? We'll we'll share the your social media, but do you have a newsletter, right? I do. I do have a newsletter. I I put out a newsletter probably at least once a month, but we are trying to get to once a week so we can kind of keep you updated to what we're doing and showing you like some parts of our process. But the best way is to go to our website, um, www.ronnicole.com. And there's nothing else to do other than subscribe. <laughs> During the spring and summer, we are in full work mode. So <laughs> we don't have any links on the website. We remove all of it. <laughs> is harvest time, you know? Right, right. Exactly. You can, you can get, get all that uh, content produced in the winter when yes. you're, you know, more mm -hmm. indoors. 
Um, that sounds great. Well, we'll share that link so people can um, follow you and sign up. And um, those who are lucky enough to come to the Slow Flower Summit at the end of June will get to hear your presentation and get to know you. And um, I'm just so looking forward to that. Thank you so much for this preview today. Uh, I am an owner of a few of your pieces, and I feel like I'm going to take that moment today to go stand in front of that camellia and just observe it and and think about what nature wants to teach me uh, through your hands and through your eyes. So thank you so much, Ronnie. Oh, thank you so much, Deborah. Okay, we'll see you soon. Hey, thanks so much for joining me today. That was wonderful. Please consider attending the Slow Flower Summit, where Ronnie Nicole will share her remarkable journey as an artist and one who draws creative and soulful guidance from nature and especially from flowers. Ronnie's presentation will take place on Monday, June 27th, and that's day two of the Slow Flower Summit. She'll uh, be followed by her talk will be followed by a Q&A. You can find all the details and see photos of the artist, her studio, her work, and her flowers in our show notes for podcast episode 559, which we'll post next week on the slowflowerspodcast.com website. Before I go, I'd like to thank our sponsors who bring this show to you. This show is brought to you by slowflowers.com, the free online directory to more than 850 florist shops and studios who design with local, seasonal, and sustainable flowers, and to the farms that grow those blooms. It's the conscious choice for buying and sending flowers. And thank you to our lead sponsor, Farm Girl Flowers. Farm Girl Flowers delivers iconic burlap wrap bouquets and lush, abundant arrangements to customers across the U.S., supporting U.S. flower farms by purchasing more than $10 million of U.S.-grown fresh and seasonal flowers and foliage annually. Discover more at farmgrowflowers.com. Thank you to flowerfarm.com. Our newest sponsor, flowerfarm.com, is a leading wholesale flower distributor, sourcing from carefully selected flower farms to offer high-performing fresh flowers sent directly from the farm straight to you. You can shop by flower and by country of origin at flowerfarm.com. Find flowers and foliage from California, Florida, Oregon, and Washington by using the origin selection tool in your search. Learn more at flowerfarm.com. Thank you to the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers. Formed in 1988, ASCFG was created to educate, unite, and support commercial cut flower growers. Its mission is to help growers produce high-quality floral material and to foster and promote the local availability of that product. Learn more at ASCFG.org. And thank you to Red Twig Farms. Based in Johnstown, Ohio, Red Twig Farms is a family-owned farm specializing in peonies, daffodils, tulips, and branches, a popular peony bouquet by mail program, and the Spread the Hope campaign where customers purchase 10 tulip stems for essential workers and others in their community. Learn more at redtwigfarms.com. The Slow Flower Show is a member-supported endeavor, and I value our loyal members and supporters. If you're new to our weekly show or a long-running podcast, check out all of our resources at slowflowerssociety.com and consider making a donation to sustain Slow Flower's ongoing advocacy, education, and outreach activities. You can find the donate button in the column to the right at slowflowerspodcast.com. I'm Deborah Prinzing, host and producer of The Slow Flowers Show and The Slow Flowers Podcast. Next week, you're invited to join me in putting more slow flowers on the table, one stem, one vase at a time. The content and opinions expressed here are either mine alone or those of my guests alone, independent of any podcast sponsor or other person, company, or organization. Thanks so much for joining us today, and I look forward to seeing you next week.